Well, greetings to you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Graham here with you to share again on this this theme, this important theme of pride and humility. I know we have spent uh, several weeks looking at this and uh, it is because it is such a, an important theme in Scripture. It is truly at the root of all sin and we need to get a, a grasp of it and quite frankly we're only touching the surface but i pray that what we've seen so far will really have helped us to identify pride in our lives and so we've been looking for some weeks now at the outworking of the universal law that jesus gave whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted We've seen that self-humbling is a prerequisite for coming to God initially, but also for any subsequent spiritual progress in the Christian life. Jesus, we saw last time, is our example. We saw other examples like Paul and John the Baptist. And so when Peter exhorts us, humble yourself, it implies it is something we must do. It's, it's a choice. How does this principle apply in our relationship to others? And this is what we want to look at today. The litmus test of our attitude towards God is really reflected in our attitude towards other people. Self-humbling is towards others is commanded in various places in the New Testament. And I just want to look at three examples beginning with Philippians chapter 2. So here we read, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Notice that humility is demonstrated when we consider others better than ourselves. It's the opposite of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The next passage is Ephesians 5. Where Paul writes, be subject to one another or submit to one another in the fear of Christ. The implication is very clear. If we really fear and reverence Christ, it will be seen in our attitudes towards one another. We will not merely be submissive to Christ, but we also be submissive to one another. If we claim to be submissive to Christ, but are not submissive to one another, then our claim of submissive to Christ is actually not true. The third example is from 1 Peter 5, where Peter in verse 5 writes, Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now in the Greek, the word that is translated clothe yourselves specifically means to put on a certain type of apron, that was worn only by slaves. In other words, Peter was saying, wear the attitude of a slave towards others. That is the true expression of humility. Now what I want to do, having looked at these different passages in the New Testament and these exhortations to humble ourselves, let's just look at an example of, of how these principles are played out in two lives in the Old Testament that of Abram and that of Jacob. So let us read uh, Genesis chapter 13, verse 5 to 8. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great they were, they, that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's, the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine. For we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Abraham says to Lot, we are relatives, we are brothers. They were surrounded by enemies. So Abraham makes an appeal to Lot that they should not be quarreling as enemies because that would give their true enemies leverage over them. 
Now if we carry on reading from verse 9. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zohar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set towards the east. Two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So in this passage we see Abram's astounding humility. Here was Abram, the, the man of God's choice, the man with the special calling, the man whom the inheritance belonged. Lot was merely part of his entourage. For when the time came for them to separate, Abram didn't take an arrogant position. He didn't insist upon his way, saying, you know, I'm the man, I'll choose. Abram gave Lot the first choice. He said, whatever you choose will be yours. You know, I'll take whatever is left. Think of Paul's words. Do not look after your own interests. That is, again, the, the, the essence of humility. Not looking after your own interests, but the interests of others. This is precisely what uh, Abram does. So in the closing verses from verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and the south to the east and the west. All the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. And then we read that he built an altar to the Lord. Now God repeats his promise to Abram of making his offspring like the dust of the earth. And he says, go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I'm giving it to you. Derek Prince notes that it was only after the act of self-humbling that Abram saw his inheritance. Up to that time, he had been standing right in the midst of it, but God had not really revealed it to him. God chose to reveal it to Abram only after he had humbled himself before his young nephew Lot. This is such a graphic picture of the reward of self-humbling, of humility. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so here we have a graphic example uh, and demonstration of humility in the life of Abram. But just very quickly, our second example is that of Jacob. And we know the story of Jacob, don't we? How he deceitfully stole his brother's birthright with the help of his mother. He received his father's blessing reserved for the oldest son, Esau. And as a result of what he had done, he found himself running from his brother, a fugitive for years. He had an encounter with God, remember. An angel wrestled with him all night, but because of his own strength, the angel could not prevail. And so the angel touched Jacob's hip, dislocating it, rendering Jacob helpless. He pleaded with the angel for the blessing, which the angel granted to him. But from then onwards, he walked with a limp, always a reminder to him that he had come to the end of his own strength and ability before God could use him. But in chapter 32, if you read Genesis 32, we read of how Esau is coming after him and was just on the other side of the field when he was, and he was terrified. But you'll notice what happened. It says he went ahead of his family to Esau, bowed down to the ground seven times, and Esau ran to meet Jacob and he embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. And we read, they wept together. What a beautiful picture. Here is Jacob. Here is the, the deceiver. The man to whom belonged the birthright, the blessing, the entire inheritance. Uh, he was the one who had wrestled with the angel and encountered the Lord. He was the man of God's choice. On the other hand, coming to meet him was Esau, the, the carnal man, 
the man who had despised his blessing, the man whom God could not accept because of his wrong attitude towards spiritual matters. And yet when they met, Jacob, the spiritual man, bowed down seven times before his offended brother. Jacob had learned the lesson. He had discovered that pride would get him nowhere. And so he humbled himself before the angel. But that wasn't enough. He had to humble himself before his brother as well. And in doing so, it brought reconciliation and opened the way for Jacob to enter safely into the inheritance that God had promised him. We see that although God had clearly promised the inheritance, Jacob could not receive it until he had humbled himself, until he had confessed what he had done, not only before God, but also before his brother. And so both those are incredible examples of how we we need to uh, humble ourselves before others. That we don't only humble ourselves before God, but we humble ourselves before others. And so I pray that as we ponder on those two examples, as we look again at the exhortations that we have in Philippians 2, in Ephesians 5, and in 1 Peter 5, that we would clothe ourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let us pray. Lord, we again thank you for your word. We thank you for these exhortations. We thank you for these incredible examples of humility in the lives of Abraham and Jacob. We pray, Lord, that we would emulate them and that we would indeed humble ourselves before you. But most of all, humble ourselves before others, that we may also be lifted up and so just bless us as we go into this day lord continue just to remind us of all that we've learned around this theme of pride and humility and may we make that choice to be humble and we ask this in jesus name amen amen bless you have a wonderful day further